Welcome in everybody to the flagship podcast interview. We are talking to uh, inside the red Raiders.com publisher, Jarrett Johnson, Jarrett. I mean, it is a big week because Chris Beard is headed back to Lubbock on February 1st. And there's a lot to get into here. Um, but, but first and foremost, let's talk about Texas Tech in this basketball team under Mark Adams because they are getting it done. I mean, uh, they have a stronger resume than Texas right now. Yeah, no doubt. First off, man, Chip, thanks for having me on. I always enjoy doing all this stuff with you. Uh, Y'all do a great job over there. <clears throat> yeah, no, they're they're really good. They're better than they've been. They're as good as they've been since they went to the Final Four, you know, went to the National Championship game. Uh, they're big. This is one of the biggest tech teams, really, I could ever remember. Um, and it's not just one or two guys. I mean, they're deep in their front court. Right now, Bryson Williams is playing as good as anybody in the conference. Uh, Kevin O'Banner actually – has been struggling from the perimeter, which is that's what he was known for uh, when Oral Roberts went on that sweet 16 run. I mean, he was putting up 30 points a night, you know, 20 to 30 points a night in the, in the tournament. And uh, he's a good rebounder, but he's been doing most of his damage on the boards and, you know, in the paint, but him and Bryson Williams together have been a great one, two punch. Then they come off the bench with Marcus Sanchez Silva, uh, who started a lot of games at the division one level. Uh, and he's really kind of evolved into this super team player, super, uh, defender. Uh, and then they got this almost seven foot guy who was a four star recruit who went to Arizona, battled some injuries. Daniel Bacho, who's really talented. He's been the surprise of the team. And his stats, if you look at it, won't wow you, but he really helps as a rim protector. And he's a, he's kind of the guy who's like the most imposing guy in terms of athletically and his size that you'll see in, in, in most, uh, you know, Division one games. So he'll throw down on people's heads, and he's he's a great rim protector. So to have those four guys for Texas Tech is quite the luxury. Then they have a plethora of 6'5 to 6'7 wing guys that can all do all the things defensively that Mark Adams demands of his team, but then also they're pretty dang good finishers on the break. And, uh, and you know, just been tough. They've been a really tough team. They showed it uh, just in Lawrence where they battled back. They were down by double digits late. And they didn't win. They lost in double overtime to Kansas. But, uh, you know, they beat Baylor and Waco, uh, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tennessee in a really weird game where neither team could make a shot. It seemed like forever uh, at Madison Square Garden, but gutted out a victory at overtime. And like you said, the, right now, Texas Tech has a pretty dang good uh, resume. Yeah, I mean, and they they got no favors um, the week that they had the, the, the wins over Kansas and Baylor. You know, they played four games in eight days. They ended up losing, you know, uh, to Kansas State at the right. end of that stretch. But talk about what you saw um, from, you know, they lose the, the the tight one at Iowa State. Yeah. But then they that come back. Seven they, players, too. Seven players. That's all they had because of COVID. Yeah. So and take, yeah, take us through that stretch. It was just really tough. I mean – uh TJ Shannon is one of their better players, and he he's only playing like half their games because he's had back problems. And there was an eligibility question to start the season, and Tech really was almost overzealous. Like they didn't want you know they wanted to make sure they didn't forfeit any of those wins, which was smart. And he ended up everything checking out, and he's he was eligible finally. But then he had back problems. Kevin McCullers battled flu problems, like all of us have had some kind of whether it be COVID or allergies or flu or whatever. It seems like everybody out there, you know, been battling something. Uh, it really got him where he actually had to have surgery right before the season, but he's still been struggling that. Then he had ankle problems. So there's your two of your better players that just they can't get right, can't seem to get healthy, can't stay in the lineup. And then there was all this COVID. COVID went through uh, Tech, and then the, just the the safety protocols as well. So they ended up going to uh, Iowa State, one of the toughest places to play there. They held. Uh, with just seven players, and really, you can make the argument they should have won the game. They missed some, you know, a lot of free throws. They really, despite only having seven guys, kind of blew it there. Um, but still, it was like, okay, that was an admirable performance. Then you come back and uh, you, you you play Kansas. You think that's going to be a loss, uh, but no. I mean, you you pretty much control the game. I believe they got Kevin McCullough back for that one. Um, it's hard to keep up with <laughs> when guys were back and out, but. Uh, 
and they, they control the game. They dominate in the paint. I was talking about the front court before, and uh, they, which is really weird to say, to dominate Kansas in the paint. But I think it was like 44 to 18, and they out-rebounded by almost 10 in that game. And really, it, it, like, it wasn't as close as the score. It took one by eight. And so then you think, okay, well, hey, you know, at least you won that game. Now you got go to go to Waco and play the defending champs who hadn't lost in 21 games or something like that. And you think that's probably a loss in Waco. But, uh, man, Red Raider Nation showed out. There was a lot of Texas Tech fans there in Waco. It almost felt like a home game for them, a lot of the players said. And uh, the players really responded, and, and they, you know, pulled off a huge win uh, for the resume. So that was great. And you think, okay, they have Oklahoma State. That was the makeup game that was originally going to be the, the Big 12 opener. You think there's going to be a letdown. These guys got to be tired, you know, all that. Just a couple of days after that, that Baylor game. But they ended up beating Oklahoma State by 21, uh, 20 or 21. And, again, just dominated the game. And so at that point you're like, well, you know, I know they got to go to Manhattan, Kansas, and it's an 11 a.m. game on Saturday, and Tech's been through this gauntlet, but I don't want to shortchange these guys. I mean, they've been tough. You know, I expect them to come out with a win, even though Kansas State's better than their record. I think we all know uh, they lost some close games. They're still a pretty good, good team. Um, but now tech went out there. They didn't play their game. Uh, the defense wasn't there. They got crushed on the boards and credit to Kansas state. They were ready to play. They were hungry for the victory and they got the win. And so then tech bounced back by beating Iowa state at home, beat West Virginia who gave them a fight because it's West Virginia, but tech pulled away late. And then they had that epic battle in Lawrence double overtime where the game was right there. And, uh, Man, you got to give credit to Kansas. They played a really good game, but man, Tech had their opportunities. They battled back, and they're up by five in the in the first overtime, and uh, with less than a minute, maybe even close to thirty seconds, and it got away from them. They lost, so that's a tough one to to swallow. But I think everyone's eyebrows, our eyes are are open to how good this Tech team is and how good they 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 could be. Yeah, I mean they're doing it. They're doing it with defense, and they're doing it with a bunch of different guys. Um, Jarrett, I mean, when I look at the box scores, like you said, I mean, it's McCuller one night, it's Adonis arms, uh, in the win over Baylor. It's, you know, O'Baner, uh, against Oklahoma state. I mean, it's, it's different guys. So talk about the identity of this, uh, Texas tech basketball team. Well, they really are. And you hear this a lot, but they really are an unselfish team. They're a tight team. I know, uh, Kevin McCuller said, this is the tightest team he's ever been on. They're close off the court. I know they all have a lot of respect for Mark Adams. I mean, it starts with him and his staff that he amassed. It's a really good staff. Um, they've done a, uh, for Texas Tech, they've done a, a pretty dang good job on the recruiting trail. And uh, they've done an even better job this season because it, this is a deep team. This is truly a, a deep team. And to me, the biggest challenge for Mark Adams is managing the minutes. Because in the game against Kansas, you know, Adonis Arms was struggling a little bit, but he didn't play a lot. And, you know, you look back at that Baylor game, and he was a star in that game, like you said, Chip. So it's it's really interesting how, from night to night, how Mark Adams manages his roster. And I think it's definitely, though he's, he's a veteran coach, he's been a head coach for a long time, uh, prior to being an assistant for a long time, um, still – it's for anyone, for any coach, this would be a challenge. And it, it's a good challenge to have to, to have depth, but um, down the right buttons. Like I, I feel like Shannon played too much. McCuller played too much against Kansas, but how can you fault him for playing two of your best guys in a place like Lawrence, Kansas? So um, it's just, it's a good, like I said, it's a good problem. I don't mean to repeat myself, but I just keep going back to it. It's a good problem to have, but it is a problem at times. Like, uh, you got Malik Wilson, who we haven't even mentioned. He was huge in that first win over Kansas. He played some uh, in, in the rematch, but where does he fit in as a point guard? Clarence Nadalny was huge in that. He had 17 uh, career high 17 against Kansas in that big win, and he barely – I mean, he didn't see the court a whole lot in the second game. So it's a balancing act for Mark Adams right now, but, you know, it's better than not having enough guys, that's for sure. If – if um... What would you say? I mean, obviously they're they're playing well as a team, and that's a strength. But if you were to say the strength of Texas Tech is blank, and the weakness is blank, yeah, the strength is defense. I mean, I think everybody knows that. Um, I guess just to add something different, other than what 
you know, everybody knows Texas Tech plays defense in basketball is that uh, I, I'd i say they're rebounding. I, at times, I feel like they could dominate teams on, on the glass to go along with that, that defense. Uh, and then their weakness is perimeter shooting, whether it be from uh, the three-point line or the free throw line. They, they've lost a couple of games because of their poor shooting at the free throw line. And then another weakness is they don't really have a true point guard, like a floor general. They have a couple of guys who can play point guard. Adonis Arms has done a good job. Kevin McCuller plays some point. But you can't harass Tech into too many turnovers. So I, this team is, like, very good. I think this is a this is maybe the second or third best Texas Tech team I, I've seen, uh, potentially. But they there are some weaknesses, for sure. When you look at um, this game with Texas – and Chris Beard coming back to Lubbock. Um, obviously, there's a lot of respect between Chris Beard and Mark Adams, but the fan base is is going to be. I mean, you you tell us what what's that atmosphere going to be like? There's been a lot of talk about that. You know how it is on a message board and just like around town. I mean, uh, that's what people want to talk about now. The football season's over, uh, and uh, you know, I think the consensus is. Uh, I guess from older people is that we know the media is going to say like, no matter what happens, the stories are like, from my perspective, the story has already been written like all oh, the classless people at tech, but you know, did this and that no matter what happens. But the hope is that everyone is safe. Nothing is actually like thrown. Uh, nothing like out of bounds is said, um, you know, I kind of keep it classy. Lubbock, you know, I, there's a lot of emotions with this. The people in Lubbock feel betrayed by Chris Beard, whether right or wrong. There's two sides to the story. Uh, that's that's the way people feel. Um, and I think that in Chip, you know, Lubbock, uh, that's probably the worst thing you could do, like in like to be uh, deemed a traitor or someone who's disingenuous. That's that's just so against West Texas um, and just the way people are out here. Uh, now the fan base, the in term, I mean the the student section, which is always rowdy uh, at Texas Tech. That's a whole nother thing. Um, again, you hope everyone is safe. Uh, nothing too, too terrible, out of bounds is said. But at the same time, just as a fan, let's just say like I'm a wound to the tune Cow Dallas Cowboys fan. Unfortunately, right now. Uh, but I, I always look at, a, at the best. <laughs> say what? Sorry about that. No, Cowboys. sorry. The Cowboys. I know. Oh, man, that was just oof. break your heart. Yeah, they do all the time. But, you know, as a fan, I want the crowd, I want there to be like a sense of fear in the crowd, like to be that, you know, raucous of a crowd, but nothing actually happened. Those are the best crowds. And I think that's the hope. And there's been some talk of like, turn your back and don't say anything to him when he comes in the, like a silent stare or whatever, or just ignore him and, that's just not the reality of what's going to happen. It's going to be very loud. It's going to be very rowdy. They're going to feel right on top, like Texas. The players are going to feel like the, the fans are right on top of them. The student section is right there. Um, it's going to be crazy. I know, like, seats are going for, like, nosebleed seats are going for a ridiculous amount of money. I mean, you, people are, uh, you know, definitely there were seats over $1,000 for, for, for this game. So wow. I don't even know. That was like two weeks ago. I don't know what it is right now, but it's got to be, uh, it's got to be really expensive to go to that game now. Yeah, and it's weird that they haven't played yet. Like Texas has finished their series with K State and Oklahoma State, but hasn't played Tech or Baylor or Kansas yet, even once. So February is going to be nuts um, because you're going to get two of these matchups. Yeah. And yeah, Tech and that's is, interesting too. Is like, I mean, there's going to be, as always, there's going to be a lot of Texas Tech fans in Austin too for that game. Yeah, and so when you look at how the roster changed when Beard left, because some guys transferred, but guys mm -hmm. stayed. Talk about how you know that roster came together. Well, it's interesting because like Terrence Shannon and Kevin McCullough weren't going to stay at Beard was staying which isn't really talked about because it doesn't matter. He's gone. But McCuller was pretty much gone. Like he was. Um, but when Beard left, they came back. And then even a couple of other guys considered coming back, but they didn't. Um, 
And so then, yeah, I mean, they put together all these guys via, you know, junior college, uh, the transfer portal. I think they, they added five guys that were double digit, digit scores at other division one schools. So um, it was interesting. I Kevin McCullough coming back was like the biggest, like the land, the landmark announcement because he just does everything that exemplifies what this program is supposed to be in terms of, uh, you know, being that, that six, six wing player who can do everything, the, the Grant Hill light type player, um, but a great defender and a team first guy, Terrence Shannon coming back was also ginormous. Uh, but getting guys like Davion Warren, who scored 20 points a night at Hampton division one school. That was crazy. Kevin O'Banner, who of course played about as good as anybody in the NCAA tournament, put up 30 on Ohio state in the first round, had a couple more double doubles after that on Oral Roberts' uh, Sweet 16 run. Bryson Williams, I actually thought he was going to be going to Texas, but uh, I think, I don't know if Texas was full and just said no, and, but he ended up at Tech, and he looks like he's first-team All-Big 12, right? He's put up 33 points uh, against Kansas and Lawrence, so um, he's been tremendous. Adonis Arms is a tremendous story, a walk-on junior college player who just kept climbing the ladder, and uh, he's a really cool dude. We had him on our radio show before the season and everything, and uh, – He's just a really neat dude from Milwaukee, played like in Idaho and uh, like all over the country to get to to the stage he's on right now, playing Big 12 ba uh, basketball, getting to play Madison Square Garden early in the season and just everything he's getting to experience, having that big game against Baylor and Waco, just all, all that. Um, that. That's, you know, really cool. Malik Wilson was a big time player for Louisiana Lafayette for coming over. So you just amassed all these guys. And like I said, it's a really deep roster. Oh, yeah, Daniel Bacho, like I said, the guy from Arizona. You mass all these guys, right? How are they going to be able to mesh and be at this close team? And, you know, they are, um, which is a big credit to the coaching staff. And I think, well, what it, all, what it all starts with is them buying in on playing this defense. And once you do that, everything else kind of unfolds from there. And then they started, you know, having this success playing for each other. And then you start seeing the results we've seen. Mark Adams, what was the reaction like when he got the job and what, how has he been as a head coach? He's great, man. I, he's a, he's like the old, uh, like your granddad, you know, like everybody uh, likes him, but you don't want you don't want to get in trouble with him where he makes you go get that switch. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's that kind of guy. He's a tough dude, but he's, you know, uh, he's looked at as like that nice grandpa kind of guy. He passes out candy to us media at, at practices and stuff. He has this candy jar where he, he has on his desk where he wants players to come in and watch film with him and gives him, you know, candy. Uh, but no, he, um, he's refreshingly candid. Sometimes you're like, whoa, he's giving away too much <laughs> in these press conferences. Um, the reaction was, uh, uh, first off, there was a groundswell from former players, which was, was I, you know, I actually put together a story from all the reactions and talking to the players and just what they were posting on social media. But, I mean, the guys that went on the Elite Eight run, uh, like the Keenan Evans and the Zach Smiths, those guys from, from that era, uh, Norris Odiasi, who was on part of both those teams, the Elite Eight and the uh, National Championship team, Jarrett Culver, all those, all those guys, uh, Brandon Francis, were just clamoring for Kirby Hoka, the athletic director, to hire, to just promote Mark Adams. And once he was hired, people rejoiced because he is a West Texan. He's a Texas Tech grad. You know, he had the, the whole statement, uh, Beard wanted me to sit in the middle seat and go and wear orange, and I didn't want to do either one of those. And so, you know, obviously that went over the fan base. Um, and then most of the people uh, who really follow Texas Tech basketball know that he's been the architect of the defense. So, and that he had experience as a head coach. You know, he won a national championship at the junior college level, um, and he's been around Big 12 basketball for years. So, People were excited. I think the big question was, could he recruit? Could he put together a coaching staff? He did that, or a really good one. Could he uh, Could he recruit? And he's put those to bed. And to me, it was, okay, how can he manage this rotation? I mean, he's put a lot of the questions for him to bed. So now it's just, how do they do the rest of the season? How do they do in the tournament is going to be – those are the next questions. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been uh... – it's been fun to watch. They're they're high energy. They play with confidence, and um, 
you know, they're clearly used to the demands, the defensive demands of that program where I think Texas with all the new transfers, they're still adjusting to all the demands of, you know, what it takes to play for, for Chris Beard. You never know how that's going to go. I mean, that was why it was a big question. I mean, like a guy like Davion Warren's a good, from Tech's perspective, I mean, he was a 20 point scorer. Is he going to accept, you know, scoring maybe eight points a game, but, you know, and becoming a defender and he has, but you know, you don't, I mean, you can say that during the recruiting process and we're going to make you a better, you know, more complete player, but you never know how a player is going to react if they'll actually buy into it or not and just how it's all going to go. So it's this, it's a, it's a new world out there with the transfer portal in every sport, you know, um, and we certainly see it in basketball. Well, and it looks like the fan base is as, is rabid. And I mean, they, they're, you know, that following for tech basketball, you, you describe to us because every time you watch a tech game, it's, it's just rowdy as can be. It's really, it's crazy because the, like the student section has really, or like the, 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 the student body has really responded. I mean, they camp out like for like West Virginia and I camp out, but they line up hours before the, they'll probably camp out for this one <laughs> for the UT game. But, uh, you know, they line up for hours. I mean, you can see it wrapping around just going forever uh, to get in and get their, you know, their seat to be the, the ones who get the, those, uh, those, I guess that there's a fee, but it's basically a free seat at this point. Um, so, I mean, there's a demand there and uh, the price of tickets have gone way up. I remember for a big 12 game, just because, you know, sometimes my staff will cover and I try and take my boy to one game a year uh, in basketball and I remember going to a Big 12 game where you can get third row seats for like 20 bucks, like six or seven years ago. Now those seats for a, any Big 12 game is like 120 bucks. So that gives you an idea of just at least the demand and love it and how it's changed. And yeah, obviously Chris Beer was a huge part of that. Um, a ginormous part of that. And, but I think uh, Mark Adams and just who he is, the culture that's still here, the fact that, I mean, you ask a lot of tech fans and they'll say Mark Adams is as big a reason for the culture as coach Beard. You know, I, you could argue that forever. I, I think you got to give credit where credit's due. Um, I try and keep it, keep it real. Be honest. You know, Chris Beard did some amazing things here. Um, and, but that's definitely carried over. Nothing has dropped off one bit. I mean, the level of play quite honestly is better than it's been the last two seasons and the fan base is as rowdy and as excited about it as they've ever been. Well, the decision of Jalen Tyson um, to leave Texas and go to Tech, he'll he'll sit out, you know, and and mm -hmm. then he'll be eligible to play next season. But how did that how did that news hit um, the Tech campus? Well, I, to be honest, I think most people they're excited about getting that player, you know. Um, his potential offensively is off the charts, you know, so that's exciting, but also it was further evidence to Texas tech fans that Chris Beard uh, has a problem with uh, kind of the blue chip higher echelon players. I mean, there's been a, a pattern of guys not making it like halfway through the season over the last couple, couple of seasons. And so of course they delighted in that given what all has transpired between Beard and the fan base. But in the fact that not only did he leave, but he went, you know, came to Tech after being committed, even signing before going with Beard. I, I think a lot of people, you know, were happy to see that. I think that's the best way to say it is like, here's further evidence that Beard, you know, has a hard time with, you know, with the higher echelon players or won't won't be patient enough. Like that was a thing here before, even during the national championship run and after that. Like he wasn't patient with bigs, which kind of drove people crazy. Like, you know, after a year or so, they would all transfer out. And sometimes they'd have success where they went. So I think that's just a storyline, whether it's valid or not. Again, that could be debated, but um, that was further evidence for, for some folks. Well, it was a it was a big decision for Kirby Hocutt. We'll uh, we'll take a quick break here on the flagship podcast with Jared Johnson, publisher of Inside. Uh, the Red Raiders.com will get a couple thoughts from him on uh, the new football coach. Uh, Joey McGuire will do that next. And if you're 
watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel will roll on. And and Jarrett, um, obviously, uh, Matt Wells out, Joey McGuire in. What has been the vibe uh, with Joey McGuire? It's been amazing. Um, actually, there's more momentum with tech football since I this is I've been here just over eight years covering Texas Tech exclusively here in Lubbock. And I mean, people were excited about Kingsbury when he was hired, but it was also like, you know, does he have the experience to do this? So there were some people that weren't, you know, completely on board with the Kingsbury deal, despite all the excitement about it. McGuire, he came in on his introduction and just crushed it. I mean, he, he started off with a Raider power chant. And I was right there. It was like, it blew people's mind, just his whole introduction. And then, I mean, the night he was announced that, uh, as the coach, he got three pretty big commits. Um, and that's the thing is like, so I used to be at the Fort Worth Star Telegram for six years. And when part of that was when he was at Cedar Hill and some of the guys on the staff were there. And I, I covered their programs a lot. So I know who he, who he brought in. I know the connections they have with the Texas High School uh, Football Coaches Association. And there's really not anyone out there, maybe a handful of other coaches who have the connections and the reputation that Joey McGuire does with head coaches across the state. And anybody who knows recruiting knows it's all about relationships, um, that how invaluable having that kind of uh, reputation and, and those kind of connections are. So we're seeing it right now. Uh, for example, he was hired in November. Tech was like around 80th in the country and last in the Big 12 for the 2022 class. They closed or they're closing at about 40th and they've moved up a couple of spots like seventh in the Big 12. The 2023 class is top 10. It's very early, but I mean, usually by now, Tech might have one commit for the next class. I mean, they have like a half a dozen and some, it was a four star. They got their quarterback already. I mean, the recruiting is off the charts. The energy, um, the reception from people. He's a he, his daughter graduated from Tech. His best friend played football for Tech. Um, he he gets it. He knows West Texas. Uh, it's a perfect fit, to be honest. And now it's just it's going to be those questions like how is he as a game manager? How does how does he develop the talent? All that stuff we'll have to see. But the initial reaction is just excite is just extreme excitement. Where are the biggest question marks for tech football going into spring football, um, you know, with the losses from last year's team? I, you know, they, it remains the same. And I actually uh, had an interview with Coach McGuire. Uh, let me see, I can't remember. It was in December. I can't remember if it was before. Yeah, it was just before Christmas. And we were talking just about that. And really, he sees exactly what the problem has been. And it's in the trenches on both sides is that, there's been some good players, but there's not enough. There's not enough depth. And you don't have those dominant players. He wants those mean, dominant players in the trenches. And he's going about stockpiling them uh, on the offensive and defensive line. So, I mean, they're recruiting defensive line better than I've ever seen in a Texas Tech. I, it's, I mean, they're getting guy, like enough guys, good players, and the type of athletes that TCU, Texas, Oklahoma State normally get. And, and – that Tech will get in the final three, four, but don't actually land. They're getting those kind of guys. Uh, so that's where they need uh, the most help, w whether they'll be ready to, to do it in the in the first season or not. I mean, probably not, but that's that's where they need. If Tech wants to take that next step, they got to get better up front on both sides. And then, I mean, losing a guy like Colin Schooler, uh, Rico Jeffers, those guys at linebacker, that's tough to replace. They have some good players coming up. They really do. They do the transfer in from Florida. Uh, 6 2 240 can run Josiah Pierre. He played a lot last year. He can play. Um, they've, they've actually brought in some really good recruits at linebacker I'm excited about. Again, whether they're ready to go the first year, I don't know. But you can't lose a guy like Colin Schooler uh, and just, just replace him. That's just not going to happen. So that's going to be tough. And then the secondary, they have to get better too. So, they have, I mean, they have a lot of room, room for improvement. But I tell you what, I feel really good about quarterback. I feel really good about running back. And um, I, I, they're going to be better on defense, I think, than we've seen for a long time at Texas Tech, just by the way that Joey McGuire uh, runs his football program and, and the staff he brought in. How do you think the quarterback uh, situation plays out? 
it's going to be fun, man. I, I keep going back and forth. I mean, Tyler Shuck, I, I can see it in, in Zach Kitley's. And that's a whole nother reason for optimism. Zach, Zach Kitley, the offensive coordinator was 24 seven sports, uh, national offensive coordinator of the year. Uh, and he was pro football focused quarterback coach of the year. So really excited about his offense, uh, that he's bringing in. And then, yeah, Tyler Shuck is a guy who he just seems like he's a perfect fit for the system. But then Donovan Smith, I mean, he's a gamer. You know, I saw him play for Friendship, a big football game. I think it went to quadruple overtime where he threw for three touchdowns, ran for a couple, caught a two-point conversion that won the game on like a reverse pass. I mean, he's he's a guy who will lull you to sleep, you know, throw some inaccurate balls, and all of a sudden he hits you for like a 40-yard run or a 50-yard pass. And he's just – he knows how to play the position, and his but his ceiling is still so much higher than what we saw as a redshirt freshman. So they are two different players. Um, they're both athletic. They both have big arms. And then there's Baron Morton. He's one of the highest rated guys you've ever, or you've signed in the modern era, you know, this, this century. And he has all the skills uh, and he's a, he's a dude, you know? So as coach McGuire told me here recently, that that's the reason why he wasn't adamant that they go after somebody with the 2022 class, because he feels really good about those three guys. And they're all coming, you know, they're all coming back for spring ball. That's big time. That's uh, that's gonna be fun to watch. No. Yeah, who'd have thunk after Texas beat Tech seventy to thirty-five in September that Tech would be the team uh, going bowling in Texas would be sitting at home. But that's uh, that's how it's it played out man, week to week. And you know what? Like a lot of things happened from that. Like that and the TCU game, the way they were running, like that led to Wells, uh, that and then the Kansas State game. But it was like, you know, after the Texas and the TCU where, I mean, just the strategy on defense against those two teams was, oof, it was, it was difficult. But then uh, the Kansas State game where they got shut out in the second half and lost to a, just a, not a very good Kansas State team uh, was, was the final nail in Coach Wells' coffin. And that was – and Coach Wells is interesting, you know, personally um, – I've had some difficult times family wise and coach Wells was great with my family, man. I couldn't like, he's, he's truly a friend of mine. Um, and honestly, I, I got to give a shout out to coach Beard. When uh, my wife passed away last summer, uh, coach Beard was one of the first people to reach out and call me. And I know people like to talk about black and white with people. And that's just not the reality um, of, of a lot of things. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that coach Beard was, you know, of course his mom's a two time cancer survivor and just, that, that he reached out and uh, said some really nice things to me. And Coach Wells, the same way. I, I, I truly consider him a good friend of mine. He'll always be a friend of my family. But uh, on the other hand, business-wise, it was the right decision to let go of Wells. And the way they went about hiring Joey McGuire, where he was able to uh, recruit while Sonny Cumbie still coached the team and coached the team to a bowl game, like you said, improbable bowl, bowl game appearance after that debacle against Texas was really, it turned out being the perfect way to handle it. Um, and I think you'll see teams try and duplicate uh, programs, try and duplicate that in the future, but we'll have to see. Yeah. Sonny Cumbie sure was pumped up on the sideline. Of course he's, <laughs> yeah. I he's thought he was going to stroke out, man. <laughs> yeah. He's like, Hey, I'm going to be a head coach. I want to show everyone I've, I've got this. And yeah. that, uh, that was, that was cool. I like, I like Sonny. What, he's um, a great guy. everybody likes Sonny. Yeah. And I mean, and Cliff Kingsbury, I mean, Cliff gets let go in, in Lubbock, but you know, we had a really successful season this year with the Cardinals. Obviously they didn't go as far in the playoffs as they would have liked, but I mean, there's gotta be some, some, uh, some happiness for, for Cliff. Oh yeah. You know, he was I, like, again, I try and be as honest as possible. And that's, you know, just the way I, I like to, to go, go about this. I know people try and pull punches and everything, but the truth is Kingsbury was a terrible head coach here. He was terrible. He really set the program back. But what a great guy. I mean, he – I have so much respect for the man. Like, he did so many things that he demanded not go public. Um, and he treated people with so much respect, whether it be the janitor or his coordinator or whatever. I mean, he is just a, a person to model yourself after in terms of work ethic, um, the way you carry yourself. I just, so from that regard, I mean, yeah, I can't be any happier than, uh, you know, 
for Kingsbury. Other than that, win against the Cowboys, of course. <laughs> yeah. Going back to my fandom. But, no, I, you know, great guy. Uh, he lo- was learning on the job here, struggled. I think he's obviously more well-suited for the NFL game, and he's showing that. Okay, last thing. Um, baseball season is right around the corner, Jarrett. Texas Tech baseball is always, uh, you know, a college World Series contender, it seems. What uh, yeah. What's Tim Tadlock got going out there? He's got some transfers. He brought, he brought in some new arms. He's still got Jace Young, one of the top players in the country, going to be a pro player. Uh, some veterans coming back on the infield. Uh, you know, as long as Tim Tadlock is the head coach of Texas Tech, they're going to be a top 10 program. I mean, that's just the way it is. He's still there. He's still doing his thing. Uh, he was excited about, um, you know, he, I, I saw him right after Tech beat Iowa State, and he was right there in the crowd and everything, having a good time. He is just, again, I think sometimes it, it really does come down to fit. Like a coach might be perfect in one place. He goes somewhere else, and it just doesn't work. He is the perfect fit for Texas Tech for a number of reasons. And uh, he's – you know, baseball, college baseball is not as big, obviously, as college football and college basketball. But he's one of my favorite people I've covered just because he's got this whole slow growl. And he seems like, you know, I don't want to say like he just seems very laid back. But he is sharp, man, sharp as a tack. And he always makes some kind of midseason adjustment to his team, to his lineup, whatever that is what puts tech over the top. So I can't wait to see what chess move he makes and how the roster develops, but they're going to be, they're going to battle for a big 12 title battle. Like you said, for a, for a spot in the college world series again this year. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, and now with Shalas Nagel at A&M and Kirk Sarloose coming into TCU, um, yeah. te- Texas and Texas tech are seen as, uh, yep. you know, the two big dogs in the conference this, uh, this upcoming season. Jarrett, um, great stuff, man. Really appreciate the time. It's uh, it's always fun. And look, we got this for at least, what, another year after this, and then who knows, but um, it's, always, uh, it's always a great conversation. Hey, I really appreciate you having me on. Anytime. Thanks, Chip. Well, for Jarrett Johnson, I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com. Uh, Thanks for listening to the flagship podcast interview until next time, stay safe and keep the faith.